Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thank you, Hector Bones, Tim Ashman, Johnny Hernandez, and two new patrons. Everybody welcome Justin and Bill. Justin, Justin. and Bill. <laughs> Different Justin. On this episode of DTNS, Apple Mail users may see more business logos soon, and it's actually a good thing. Uh, take solar power with you when you hike and a Chrome extension to save democracy. Or at least, I don't know, help you identify AI. This is the Daily <laughs> Tech News for Thursday, October 17th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. Uh, from deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. <laughs> ah, you were you were too into the music today. I no, I was. I normally come third. I come third on Thursdays, and uh, I was. <laughs> un, I was. I was bumped up the bench. Uh, yeah, it's a little. It's a little bit weird today. Uh, Rob Dunwood traveling. Sarah Lane has the day off. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't even do the Daily Tech newsletter today. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a uh, a guest uh, host of the Daily Tech newsletter, Jason Howell. Uh, if you go uh, to freetechnewsletter.com. Uh, in fact, Meta did some layoffs in the Reality Labs, Instagram, and WhatsApp sections, including Jane Manchin Wong, uh, who, who was hired to stop her leaking things about WhatsApp. Uh, if you want to hear more about that, Jason Howell made it the top story in the Daily Tech Newsletter uh, today when he guest hosted. So go read it at freetechnewsletter.com. Let's start with the quick hits. Google could find out Friday if its request for a stay in the Epic versus Google decision would be granted, but it decided not to wait. Wednesday, Google asked the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals to grant an injunction to delay the implementation of the sentence. So they went over the head of the original judge. The district court ordered Google to make several changes to Android by November 1st. We talked about that previously. Uh, distributing third-party app stores in the Google Play Store was one of the orders. Sharing the Google Play app catalog with third-party developers. Allowing apps to offer their own payment services. And Google says it's too short of a timeline. There's security risks. We need time to appeal this anyway. Winamp deleted its GitHub source code repo for its legacy player, making it available to developers last month. Conflicts with the Winamp collaborative license are apparently the cause for the about face. The release unintentionally included proprietary software and code from other projects. The open source community was not happy, and that included Justin Frankel, Winamp's original creator, who called the license terms absurd. Absurd, I tell you. Uh, I think more is being made of this story than is necessary, but Bloomberg reports that the European Union has warned the social media platform X that it could consider Elon Musk the entity in control of X. And why that's important is that it's the entity's total revenue that is the basis for the fine. So if the EU considers Musk, who is the sole owner of the privately operated X, as the entity, then they could include revenue from SpaceX, X.ai, and the boring company, and even Neuralink, uh, not Tesla, because Tesla's publicly held, but all these other companies, their revenue could be added together as the basis of the fine. Under the EU's Digital Services Act, platforms can face penalties up to 6% of their annual global revenue if they fail to address illegal content, disinformation, or comply with transparency regulations. I know this is confusing, because yesterday we were telling you, like, Twitter's too small, it's not going to qualify under the DMA, that's the DMA. This is the DSA. Uh, by including the combined revenue of Musk's multiple businesses, potential fines for X could be significantly higher in the case of these violations. Oh, Europe. <laughs> Google's Notebook LM, which creates a podcast of sorts from text, has added, added a customize button before it generates the conversation from your notes. The customize feature lets you enter an additional text prompt to guide the model in making the conversation. Google suggests that you could have it focus on a specific source or topic or target a particular kind of audience. Google also launched a business pilot program to explore more professional uses of the platform, expanding its reach into corporate environs. 
YouTube is expanding its premium light plan to additional countries. Uh, the plan is priced about half of the full YouTube premium subscription. It removes most ads, but doesn't include features like YouTube music, offline downloads, or background play. Uh, basically, it's just an ad remover. Currently, YouTube premium light is still being tested and available to some users in Australia, Germany, and Thailand. BKK. Apple Business Connect lets companies manage how they appear in Apple's services. Previously, this only was available to businesses with a physical location. So restaurants and uh, hardware stores, places like that. Uh, and the managed info only showed up in Maps, Siri, Spotlight, Safari, and wallet. In fact, it started just as maps. So that's why it was physical locations. Like, oh, you want to manage your listing on Apple Maps? Here you can do that. Oh, we'll add Siri. We'll add Safari. We'll add wallet. Now they're adding a bunch more things and opening it up to businesses without a physical location to sign up. Uh, they are going to let this kind of information from businesses populate in mail, in tap to pay, and in the phone app. This is good news. I know a bunch of you are like, oh, great. What does this mean? Are they going to spam me? Uh, it should actually make it easier to avoid spam. Businesses that use Business Connect can add their cover photo, their logo, business photos, promotions, even incentives and buttons like order pickup or view menu in various locations. Uh, they will also get aggregate data on how customers find the business and what actions they take when they do so. Uh, but later this year, here's the crux, Companies will be able to affect how their email shows up in the Apple Mail app. Google already does a version of this in Gmail. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in the list view for mail, you might see a company logo next to the email and a cover image at the top when you open the email that's like, oh, that's definitely Jenny's ice cream, uh, not a piece of spam pretending to be it. Also, calls can show the business name logo and the department calling, uh, which will help you distinguish it from spam. And tap to pay can now show the business logo during a transaction, which really isn't so much of a security issue, but it is kind of nice to be like, oh, yeah, that's the business uh, I'm paying versus the default logo. What do you think of these, Justin? I think it's good. And, and I do think that it's a system level improvement on a problem that is only going to get bigger. Let's start with probably the thing that's going to be affected the least, and that is phones. Because right now, I think that there is a very, very uh, uh, salient argument to be made that the telephone is haunted tech for a majority of people that use it. Not only is it in declining use with younger users, but also how many phone calls do you get a day? How many of them do you actually pick up because the vast of majority of them. of them are spam. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's the thing is that they're haunted. So let's look at spam as something that is a, a growing problem, not only on the phone, but also obviously on email, where there's been, you know, obviously decades now of trying to combat that problem. In a AI enhanced world, which is going to be something that we'll talk about a lot, you are just going to see more of this kind of stuff. And it's going to be better tailored to try to take advantage of you not only with phone calls, but also with emails. The better that system layers can be put in place, especially for things that you would interact with, with financial data or in a professional setting, the, the things that really like spear phishing would really, really hurt you on. Yes, if there is outward ways that you can put a big old sticker that this is coming from where you think it is, it's helpful. And the harder it is to spoof, the better off you're going to be. Yeah. And these are difficult to spoof. I would never say anything's impossible, uh, but it's very difficult to be able to show a logo uh, in the Apple ecosystem this way without being a Business Connect uh, entry. And to be a Business Connect entry, you do have to get a manual review. You have to apply and Apple has to verify that you're an actual business. Uh, that doesn't mean that some business isn't going to figure out a way in there somehow. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's it's pretty well governed. And so if you get a call or see an email and it's got the Wells Fargo logo by it uh, in Apple Mail or, or on the Apple phone app, you can be pretty sure, oh, that's actually from my bank. Maybe yeah. I will answer that. Maybe I can look at that email. You you won't just do what I do, which is if, if the, a phone number is there and I don't recognize it, I assume it's spam. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I don't blame anybody for doing that. I do that all the time. In fact, I, I've recently let lapse a app that sent everything to voicemail, essentially, which was not great when you're actually trying to have strangers call you, and that yeah, happens sometimes right. in the world of journalism, that you have to call, like, email a stranger, and then they're trying to get in touch with you, and they absolutely can't. But it was almost necessary for the 14 times a day that I would randomly get phone calls. This is good, and and again, if if you have just one more layer of extraction for or abstraction to make people more confident that they are clicking on what they're clicking on, then you are going to be in a better world. And email is something that will will be uh, hopefully not as haunted as phones. Yeah, uh, and uh, hopefully more than just Gmail and and Apple systems uh, can take advantage of this too, because yeah. it, it it's a it is a bit of an effort for apple to do this but you know it pays off in the back end because then they get better business listings on apple maps people use apple maps i, I would i would love et cetera, et cetera. to see some kind of open standard between a lot mm -hmm. of these like that that i think would help and and if there was you know some effort either on the private side or on the public yeah. side to to kind of put that together i think it would just be a a public good and it would benefit everybody yeah. Grandpa Merritt's going to climb up on a soapbox now and mention Tim Berners-Lee's Berners Solid again. I'll just warn you. But if you had something like Solid that was an open standard for identity management, you could have businesses taking advantage of that for themselves in a way that's verifiable uh, and, and secure. So, you know. It's okay, they, Grandpa. Let's get you to sleep. <laughs> get off my lawn. <laughs> and go out into the wild with your drone and a Bluetti hands-free <laughs> backpack power station. Uh, the Verge has an article about these. Uh, they are heavy. I'm going to tell you right now, if you don't have a strong back, you may not want to look into this. But if you do, you can carry around with you a battery uh, that will last most of a day, giving you one AC plug, 200 watt USB-C plugs, two 15 watt USB-A plugs. Uh, there's a side panel in the backpack that gives you access to all those inputs and outputs. You can manage and monitor them over Bluetooth, so you know how much power is being drawn. Uh, there's a Blue Eddy app uh, that'll let you do that. And you can charge them over solar, XT60 solar inputs. Uh, the hands-free one solar generator backpack is $299. Or if you don't already have your own solar panel, you can bundle Blue Eddies in for $499. It's a 42 liter backpack that can charge up to 300 watts. So that's enough to recharge a DJI Mavic 3 uh, or laptop about three times uh, without having to plug it into solar yet. That's just the battery on yeah. its own could charge a DJI three times or charge your laptop three times. There's also the fact that it is 11 pounds or five mm -hmm. kilograms, uh, and that's the small one. Uh, the larger one is $399, or again, if you want to bundle in the solar panels, it's $599. That does bump the battery up to 700 watts, so now you're talking six times for your laptop. Uh, it is a 60-liter pack, so you got more room in there because there, there's space for other stuff in this backpack besides the ba the battery, but it also is 16 and a half pounds. Whoa. Before before you add anything to it. Before you throw the snacks in there, folks. Yeah. That's 16 and a half on your back, dog. On your back. Seven and a half kilograms. Uh, uh, it is water resistant, not waterproof, although they do include a rain fly, uh, apparently. Uh, I, I, They are definitely marketing this towards photographers who want to go mm -hmm. out into Bryce Canyon with the DJI and, you know, take a bunch of great photos all day long. Uh, but, you know, they, they're happy to sell it to other backpackers who want to be able to, you know, charge a laptop, you know, watch some Netflix with their Starlink that they also <laughs> threw in the backpack or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's fascinating to think like we have, even though these are heavy, we have enough solar power and we, we have enough uh, connectivity now with satellite internet rolling out uh, to never be off the grid if we don't want to. A hundred percent. And and this is a, a, obviously this is going to be for hobbyists. This is going to be for, you know, people that have a specific use case in mind for it. But I don't doubt 
that there are enough of them to make it something that you'd want to get for Christmas. This is this is very much the Christmas gift, right? Like this is oh, why sure. it's coming yeah. out right now. For, for for the guy who has everything but loves to fly a drone in the middle of uh, nowhere, now you can have a $500 gift that's really going to blow their hair back. Obviously, you would love to see this uh, kind of uh, come down in terms of the weight, but it also shows that in our world that is obviously so electrified, one of the big things, and you can see it from this backpack to cars, that we have to still reconcile with is the fact that batteries are heavy. <laughs> they yeah. are they are really, really heavy. And, and for as much as we've been able to make them denser, we've been able to have them carry more of a charge and to charge faster. There's been a lot of breakthroughs. One of the things that we haven't really is weight. These things are still a load and a half. I look forward if I'm still alive to the day where the new battery tech makes it crazy that we ever dealt with lithium ion batteries that were yeah. heavy like this prone to possible accident. Uh, and you know, you're carrying around a fire hazard <laughs> in your back. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's be clear. I, I think sometimes people exaggerate the fire risk of these, but it's a legitimate fire risk. And when you're talking about backpacking out into the wilds, you're increasing the possibilities that you're going to fall or drop it and puncture it uh, or something like that. And you're also limiting your recovery options because there's no one else around. So uh, there's there's that aspect of, of this too. And someday we will have a battery or power storage technology of some sort that, that won't have that risk and won't have this weight. Uh, that said, that's, that's the pessimist, you know, the glass half empty look. The glass half full is like, we've never been able to do this before. Like, you wouldn't be able to carry this much power with you at all, even at 16 and a half pounds in the past. No. Uh, and and again, when you throw the the solar panels on there, this is something that you could legitimately just backpack through yeah. wherever you want to go. And and considering uh, how heavy it is, you'd be pretty resistant to theft because who's going <laughs> to who's who's going to snack this thing at, at damn near 20 pounds when you throw I everything else in there. I hadn't even considered the the person in the hostel who has the uh, Blue Eddy uh, hands-free backpack power station becoming the most popular person uh, in the hostel cuz he can you charge know, everybody's up. You you can't you can't write it off. Right. Like, like if, if you take that, you could backpack through wherever you wanted to go and you would never really be without all of your creature comforts, at least when it comes to connectivity. Man, I thought I was I thought I was clever for being the guy who brought the power strip to the airport back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, that's a way to make friends at CES. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the guy who actually could plop his solar panel into the window uh, and charge everything up. Uh it's it's not a light way. Uh, it's not a light way to do this. Uh, but but yeah, it's uh, the blue way. How how many people do you believe? Because this is in a very interesting price range. Like three hundred bucks is competitive enough that people would consider just yeah. buying it on Amazon without seeing it, right? Mm -hmm. Which is which is a threshold. But I wonder just how many people that <laughs> fly drones in Bryce Canyon and want and, and need to do a, a 20 minute hike to get to the perfect spot. Uh, are, there really are for, for a product yeah. like this. Well, and Blue Eddy sells a lot of other things. Uh, so these are also the kinds of products that bring you to their site. Mm. And then you go, oh, maybe I don't need that backpack, but I would like this home battery or this solar mm. charger or something like that. So uh, there's there's lots of lots of other stuff there as well. Uh, if you have a use for this backpack, let us know in our Discord. You can talk to all the folks in our audience. You can uh, send notices to us all in our Discord, which you can join by linking a Patreon account. Become a patron, patreon.com slash DTNS. Hiya, H-I-Y-A, is a spam detection company for company phone systems. Uh, their, their biggest product, the one they're touting the most, is uh, install this in your enterprise. It's compatible with all major telecommunications setups, uh, and it will 
stop the spam. It can detect AI calls. It'll secure your people from getting fished over the phone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the company also offers a call screener app for individuals that runs on Android and iOS. Uh, it's free to download, but freemium if you want to do like fancier call screening kind of stuff. Uh, and its latest product is absolutely free. It's a Chrome extension for Chrome browsers that can detect if the voice you're listening to was created by AI. So you're watching a YouTube video, listening to a podcast embedded on a web page. You can click on the extension, have it analyze it, and in a couple of seconds, it'll give you a score of how likely it thinks that what you're listening to is real or fake. Haya claims third parties say the extension is more than 99% accurate, uh, and that includes with voices created by a model that the system itself was not trained on. Like they're trained, it's trained well mm -hmm. enough. It should be able to adapt to new systems as they come. It is free to use, but you only get 20 credits a day. You can pop that button 20 times. That's to limit the, the load on their, on their servers. Um, also, and Gadget wrote, it could come in handy in the final weeks before the U.S. presidential <laughs> election. Uh, Justin, host of Politics, 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 could it? You know, when I was a young journalist, uh, I've, I've written about this and talked about it in the past, but my first day as a paid professional journalist was on September 11, 2001. And we had to, in our news department, ban the use of amongst ourselves and all of our other staff writers, the phrase in the wake of 9-11, because it was being written in every single article. I would imagine that there's probably a similar problem that editors could be more proactive about in our journalism right now with the sentence in the weeks before the US election. So let's put that there. Uh, uh, no, I don't think it would be particularly useful. We have not, you know, in, in the hot and heavy world of political ads, I would hazard a guess that probably if AI is being used, it is mostly being used as rapid response ads where it's just a generic advertiser voice. So in the, uh, uh, is Kamala Harris really good for the border? That you that is probably something that you can make faster with AI than hiring somebody to do it. I don't think that seriously, we have at least in this cycle up till now, seen credible voice cloning in, in politics in a way that it's affected anything. That being said, voice cloning is here. It's here and it's not going away. Anybody who believes that this is something that you can legislate out is kidding themselves. On the attention mechanism, my podcast with Andrew Main, uh, the first uh, uh, prompt engineer at OpenAI, he was their science communicator. We talk every week about AI. He, we talked about voice cloning this week, and he, we did it because there is now an open source model on Hugging Face that is as good as the baseline level for something like Eleven Labs, which is considered an industry leader in voice cloning. If that genie is out of the bottle, it's just a wrap. Uh, it, it's, it's we're just not going to see anybody be able to put the clamps on this unless you only want to make it something that is proliferating uh, uh, with people who break the rules. So that being said, if Haya is getting the results that they are saying, let's take them for their word. That's great. I do believe that it's probably going to be more utilized on a system level side ultimately than it is a user level side. It can be something that's interesting on a user level side, but in a world where platforms like YouTube and TikTok and Instagram want people and are asking users to self-identify AI content, using stuff like this on the system side is going to make them better at policing it and probably getting us to a better world where at least AI content that is meant to be funny or meant to be interesting or thought-provoking is labeled as such so nobody thinks that it is something that it is not. But I also don't know if it's gonna be great for, for long. AI technology moves really fast. AI detection was very good initially at uh, text, and then it became less good as the models became better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I wonder if that's gonna be the case. Uh, AI is a very not for long kind of uh, a solution based uh, uh, place right now. I think one of the advantages to detecting audio. Uh, is that it is, and, and this could apply to video in the future too, is that it is more complex than text. 
with text, you're trying to look at how the words are created and arranged and syntax and voice. With audio, you can listen in to signals. Maybe there are inaudible things that are just artifacts of the generation. Now, that, that doesn't undermine your point, right? You're, mm -hmm. those, those models are still going to get better and better at those sorts of things. But the models are less incentivized to eliminate the inaudible artifacts than they are the audible ones. What they want is you to go, wow, that sounds natural. And inaudible stuff they don't care about. Doesn't mean it won't go away, but I think I think you've got a little better chance of, of keeping uh, this good because of that. Uh, I know that the, the voice models are getting better and better all the time. Another example, in, in addition to the Andrew Main uh, podcast that you talked about that you host, uh, which is an incredible resource on this. If you're interested in the voice cloning aspect and you want to deep dive, go listen to that episode. We'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, Allison Sheridan lost her voice for, on the Nocilla cast uh, this weekend. Uh, she had done this in the past and I think used 11 labs, uh, but this time she tried a different model called Play at play.ht uh, and it sounded even better. Uh, Pretty soon, Allison will never have to host her podcast, whether she loses her voice or not, because uh, it's getting there. It didn't quite have the brightness to her voice. That was the only thing I could identify is she sounds a little cheerier than the AI version of her did, uh, but it's getting better and better. I tried this Chrome extension out on three different things. Okay. Uh, I, I went to Notebook LM, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the softball. I was like, okay, we, I know this is 100% uh, made up. Uh, take a look. It was gave it a score of one, okay. which I think is the lowest it can get. That's I don't as know low as it goes. Gives, yeah. yeah. Uh, I went to a YouTube video of Daily Tech News Show. I played that. Gave it a score of 91. 9% okay. <laughs> chance that we're not real. But mostly, Never know. that's right. Yeah. Then I went and I went on YouTube and I found those you know, what would this band sound like if it mm -hmm. was doing this other band's song? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it gave me a 49. Mm. Probably because the music was real, yeah. right? The bed music well, is probably from the original track. Well, but then yeah. they... Was it? Or Maybe. was it? I don't know, but it sounded close enough that it fooled it. I still think this is good because 49 is enough for me to raise an eyebrow. If I'm if I'm curious, right? Uh, again, it, it's like I think that this is going to be best used to guide people along the path where you should be labeling AI stuff. Yeah, like that's that's where it's like, hey, look, we want to punish or or uh, m limit the view scope of bad actors who would post AI stuff that they are not marking because they want to be deliberately dishonest. And if you have something that says, eh we're pretty sure this is AI. You upload it and, and they say like, are you sure this is an AI? If it's good enough of a tool, you can guide people a little bit on the path. But otherwise, I, I think, I don't know. I, I, I'm just, I used to be a big AI detectors will save us guy. I'm not anymore. And so I'm, I'm a little yeah. bit, I'm a little bit bearish on this. I like it as a tool. I, I like it as a tool yeah. that can tell me, uh, you know, hey, maybe be suspicious of this one. Uh, and, and, and and maybe I if it's green I'm like mm, jury's still out right uh, yeah but, but otherwise it's 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 good to have some indications like that uh, not so, easy being green and it's a <laughs> it's a free it's a free Chrome uh, extension that you don't have to lay out any green in order to use yeah all right let's check out the mailbag uh, Tim wrote in with some clarity on molten salt versus water coolant. Uh, we were talking about the fact that the uh, reactors that Amazon is contracting use molten salt. Uh, pressurized, water-cooled nuclear reactors operated around 300 degrees Celsius and 150 atmospheres of pressure, writes Tim. As you can imagine, designers are very concerned with keeping that water inside the primary loop. That requires heavy pipes and lots of redundancy. Molten salt coolant has no water. Think of it more like dry rock salt that you just heat until it melts. That type of coolant can run at even higher temperatures, but close to atmospheric pressure. I know it seems weird that you melt something and it's a coolant, but that's how hot nuclear reactors are. Taking high pressure out of the equation, it enables smaller, simpler, more efficient, and potentially safer reactors. Fun fact, Soviet Alpha-class submarines use lead bismuth coolant for the same reason. All nuclear reactors still require an ultimate heat sink, so you still need a lake or a river or an ocean or an atmosphere 
that can absorb all the waste heat. The only real difference with the new wave of small modular reactors is that their lower power compared to big traditional nuclear power plants makes the problem proportionally smaller, which makes them faster to build and all of that stuff. Thank you, Tim. That is a great explanation of the difference between uh, molten salt and the water cooling in the nukes. And we're going to get more and more of these nuclear plants being built for data centers, it looks like. So that's an important oh, yeah. stuff to consider. Uh, Martin writes, to answer Scott's question about pinch to zoom on e-ink, we were talking about the new color Kindle yesterday, I've just tested, and the Kobo Libra color does support it. So e-ink can do pinch to zoom. It's just not as smooth as it is on a tablet uh, because you got a slower refresh rate. So thank you, Martin, for testing that out. Appreciate that. And thank you, Justin Robert Young, for being with us. What do you got going on these days? Oh, Tom. Well, in the final weeks of the U.S. election, I am doing the Politics, Politics, Politics podcast, as I always have. And we've got a banger of an episode coming out this Friday. The moderator from the Ted Cruz, Colin Allred debate, Jason Whiteley of WFAA in Dallas, he is on the show. We have a draft of the narratives that will define this election. Myself, Evan Scrimshaw, and Ryan Jakubowski of Understand Politics on YouTube, we do that. Then we have a man by the name of Carl Allen, who's a data scientist. He tells us that we are paying attention to polls entirely incorrectly. You should never be looking at who is up plus one, plus two, plus three. It is only the vote share that counts. Ah, Head on okay. over. And, and that's all before. We also have a, 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 a diabolical pack that is playing both sides of one of the most contentious issues in American politics. Politics, politics, politics .com, our brand new Substack is where you need to go. We're having a great time over there. Thank you to everybody who has jumped over from Patreon, and we will see you in the PX3 universe. Definitely go do that, folks. It's uh, a must listen for me every day it's out. Uh, also must listen is Android Faithful. Uh, if you want to keep up on, like, Android 15, uh, Michelle Rahman just did a complete rundown of all the features. Kind of blew Jason's mind, actually, of how many features are in the new Android 15. Uh, go check that out. Huen Tui Dao, Ron Richards, Jason Howell, Michelle Rahman, every week, Android Faithful. You can watch it live Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific at youtube.com slash daily tech news show or subscribe to the feed and get it whenever you want androidfaithful.com patrons stick around for the extended show uh do you want a robot arm in your kitchen that can kind of cook for you all you need is hundred ten thousand dollars and we'll tell you where to spend it you can also catch the show live monday through friday 4 p.m eastern 2000 utc tomorrow it's a different daily tech news show experiment pre-recorded and then a supersized gdi live go find the details dailytechnewsshow.com slash live len peralta and dr nikki tomorrow talk to you then the dtns family of podcasts helping each other understand diamond club hopes you have enjoyed this program <laughs>